morning, we're going to look at a revelation of the ascended Jesus on this Easter Sunday morning, a time when, of course, on the church calendar, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And often in a Easter service, we focus primarily on the event of the resurrection, what led up to it, the actual resurrection, its importance, and maybe the next few days. And I'm going to highlight that same thing this morning, but we're going to take it a little bit further in time, and I want to ask you this, what about the ascension of Jesus? What about the glorification of Jesus? What about Jesus after he got to heaven? What about Jesus as he is today? And what difference does all of that make? Well, join with me, and we're going to discover the answers to that question. First of all, the resurrection. Uh, all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all give us quite a bit of detail about the resurrection of Jesus. And in John 20, Jesus appears to Mary. Then after that, he appears to the 12. And then about eight days later, he appears to the disciples as a group again. And by the way, those two times in John, when he appeared to the disciples, they were in a room of some kind. And the Bible says Jesus just appeared to them without even coming through the door. Now, wouldn't, wouldn't that be exciting that you're just there and all of a sudden he appears? Now, I don't know if that'd be more exciting or more frightening, but that was their experience. And then as we go into John 21, it says, after these things, that is after he appeared to Mary, after he appeared to his disciples on two separate occasions, he showed himself again to the disciples, verse 14, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples. Now, years later, Paul wrote and summarized the post-resurrection eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection, and I'm going to read it to you from 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 4. It says, He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Then he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve, after that, he was seen by over 500 at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. So, in that text, Paul shares with us five separate post-resurrection appearances. We see that one of the times Jesus appeared to people, it was over 500 people all at the same time. And Paul said at the time of his writing, most of them were still alive. In other words, they could have testified that yes, what Paul wrote is true. Now, why is there so much emphasis on the resurrection of Jesus. Paul went on to say this in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 14, and if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Verse 17, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. I want you to notice that the literal resurrection of Jesus from the dead is a necessity for you and I to be able to experience salvation. Not only that, but our belief in the literal resurrection of Jesus from the dead is also necessary if you and I are going to experience salvation. Paul wrote this in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. How can we be saved on this Easter morning? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, 
In other words, right where you are right now, you can bring your life under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can submit to his headship in your life. And as you confess him as your Lord, and as you believe that God rose him from the dead, Romans 10, 9 says you can be saved. And you can be saved right now, right there in your home or wherever you're listening today. Now, I want to make a statement that I want you to think about. Your spiritual life is mostly dependent on your revelation of and your connection to Jesus Christ. Let me say that again and let it sink in. Your spiritual life is mostly determined by or dependent on your revelation of and your connection to Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this morning, what is your current revelation of Jesus Christ? And what is your connection, your personal connection to the Lord Jesus Christ? In other words, not just who is Jesus to you intellectually, but who is he to you experientially? Now, I want to share with you two scriptures that support that statement that I just made. And these are powerful scriptures. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. It says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Now, Note that word glory. We're beholding the glory. We're going to come back to that word in a little bit. But beholding the glory of the Lord, as we behold the glory of the Lord, it goes on to say we are being transformed into the same image. What image? The image we are beholding from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, you and I right now, are being transformed into the very image of Jesus that we are beholding. And I want to ask you, what image of Jesus are you beholding? And are you beholding his glorious image? Now, what if the image of Jesus that you and I are beholding is deficient? Well, then the level to which we are transformed into his image will also be deficient. Let me give you another verse, 1 John 3, 2. It says, Beloved, now are we the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when, catch this, when he is revealed, we shall be like him. When he is revealed, we shall be like him. Why? Because it says, we shall see him as he is. So what makes you and I more like Jesus? It's seeing him as he is, as he actually is. Notice, not seeing him as he was, not seeing him as we think he is, but seeing him as he is. Now, I realize that this passage is probably talking more about when he returns, and when he returns, we will see him as he is, and then we will be transformed into that likeness. But that Greek word used for revealed is actually used numerous times in the Gospels, both before his resurrection and after his resurrection, to describe Jesus, even before all of this, revealing himself, who he was, <clears throat> to the people. And it's translated words like appear <clears throat> and manifest. So here's my question to you. Maybe you've never really thought about this, but is your concept of Jesus primarily, the image of Jesus you're beholding, is it primarily the pre-resurrection Jesus? Or is it the post-resurrection, post-ascension, post-glorification Jesus? And you might wonder, well, what's the difference 
and what does that really matter? Well, let's first of all look at the pre-resurrected life of Jesus. John 7, 39, it says, But Jesus, this Jesus spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, catch this, because Jesus, here it is, was not yet glorified. You see, Jesus could not give the Spirit until he ascended into heaven and was glorified, then he would give the Spirit, which happened in Acts chapter 2. But my point is, notice it says Jesus was not yet glorified. He was still God. He had still never sinned. But according to that verse, he was not yet glorified. John 7, 39. It says the disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him. That was after the triumphal entry. We looked at the triumphal entry last Sunday, Palm Sunday. Even though at the triumphal entry they were proclaiming Jesus as king, he was not yet glorified. And remember 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, as we behold his glory that we become like him. How about John chapter 12 and verse uh, 23? But Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. In other words, I'm not glorified yet, but we're approaching that time when I am about to be glorified. And then John 20 verse 17, the living Bible says it this way. Don't touch me, he cautioned, for I haven't yet ascended to the father, but go find my brothers and tell them that I ascend to my father and your father, my God and your God. So even after his resurrection, he didn't want the, them to touch him at this point because he hadn't yet ascended. He, even though he was risen from the dead, he wasn't yet glorified. So let's take a look at the ascension of Jesus. Luke 24, 51. He was gathered with his followers. Luke 24, 51. When he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Mark's account says it this way, Mark 16, 19. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. I love Acts's translation, chapter 1, 9. Now when he had spoken these things, catch this, while they watched... He was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Can you imagine? You're standing there talking with Jesus, and while you're talking, he suddenly starts ascending and disappears into the clouds. I mean, they were like just standing there, probably their mouths wide open, just stunned. And an angel says, hey, he's coming back in the same way that you just saw him leave. So Easter is not only about his resurrection and his ascension, but it is a reminder that the one who rose from the dead, the one who ascended into heaven, is coming back the same way that he left. And that's a part of the hope that you and I cling to today. Now, what happened after Jesus arrived in heaven? Well, we already saw one of the verses says he sat down. He sat down at the right hand of God. But I want to read to you uh, two different passages. And as I read these, I want you to notice the glorification of Jesus. I'm first reading from Ephesians 1, verses 20 to 22. It says, he seated him, that is, God the Father seated him, Jesus, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things. He, he restored him to that place of dominion over all things. He was glorified. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says it this way. Therefore, God also highly exalted him or glorified him 
and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every tongue should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want to remind you, friends, the day is coming when every knee is going to bow to Jesus. Every knee, those who said they didn't believe in him, their knee is going to bow. Wherever they are at that time, their knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Those who said he, he, he wasn't real, he didn't exist, they are going to confess with their mouth, with their tongue, that Jesus Christ is Lord and God will be glorified. Now, let me just ask the question this way. Back to your image of Jesus, your revelation of who he is. Is your primary image of Jesus the Jesus of the Gospels or the Jesus of the book of Revelation? Now, they're the same Jesus. We're not talking about two different beings, but we're talking about the same being in two quite different dimensions. It's, it's kind of like if you're an adult, and of course at one point you were a baby, th that baby and you, the same people, but in a, in a way different like dimension now than then, right? Okay, so let's look at a contrast between the Jesus of the Gospels and the Jesus of Revelation. Now, I'm not downplaying the Jesus of the Gospels by any means. Don't, don't neglect getting to know the Jesus of the Gospels. But what I am encouraging you is don't stop there. Don't stop there. Have a revelation of the Jesus of the book of Revelation. All right, so let's make a little contrast. The left column is the Jesus of the Gospels. The right column is the Jesus of Revelation. The Jesus of the Gospels, we see 33 years of living in a flesh and blood body. I mean, that's only 33 years. He lived in a flesh and blood body, a body like yours and mine, one that got tired, one that needed to eat, one that could experience weariness, and, and, and one that could experience all the emotional aspects of living in such a body. But I want you to know, he's not in that body anymore. He was only in that body for 33 years. The Jesus of Revelation, he is in an eternal, glorified uh, body, a spirit body, one that can't get tired anymore more, one that can't be persecuted anymore, one that can't be spit upon anymore or have any more thrones, uh, thorns driven into his head. No, he is now and forever in a glorified spirit body. By the way, the same kind of body you and I have waiting for us. Can't you wait? <laughs> The Jesus in the Gospels was tempted as a human and experienced suffering and persecution. Now, he never sinned. But he was tempted in a lot of the same ways you and I are. And of course, Good Friday, we emphasize how he was crucified. But the, the Jesus of Revelation, no longer, no longer does he face any temptation. No longer will he be spat upon. No longer will he be scourged. No longer will he be crucified. No longer will he ever again have to go to the cross because the Jesus that we uh, see in the book of Revelation again is in his eternal glorified spirit body and he'll ever be in that same state. The Jesus of the gospels was limited to being at one place at a time. He had to travel to get from point A to point B. And if he was needed in two different places, he could not be at two different places at the same time. Why? Because of the limitation of the human flesh and blood body that you and I have. And in a very similar way, you and I can't be at two places at a time. We make a choice. Where am I going to be? But the Jesus of Revelation is eternally omnipresent. In other words, the Jesus of Revelation can be right here amongst you and I today while being in your living room, while being with somebody else halfway around the world because he's no longer limited to a flesh and blood body. He is omnipresent wherever you are. He can be where you are. The Jesus of the Gospels at times could do no mighty works because of people's unbelief, according to Matthew 13, 58. The Jesus of Revelation 
is the eternally uh, ruling and reigning, omnipotent and sovereign God. In other words, the Jesus that we see today, he's not limited by the unbelief in the world today. Oh, that unbelief may keep him from moving in the lives of individuals, but the unbelief today doesn't keep him from ruling and reigning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Jesus of the gospel didn't know everything all the time. Luke 2.52 tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom. What does that mean? That means he had more wisdom as he got older. There were things Jesus did not always know. Remember uh, when he asked the, the, the father whose, whose kid was manifesting demons, he said, how long has this been going on? Why did he ask that? Because he didn't know. Why didn't he know? Because he had the limitations of a flesh and blood body. Remember when John the Baptist got beheaded, Jesus heard about it, and as soon as he heard about it, he grieved, and, and he went into, you know, to, to, to grieve. Why, why, why didn't he already know about it? Uh, because uh, he didn't know until they told him. Now, we do know that there were times the Spirit revealed to him certain things he didn't know in the natural, but the Spirit didn't reveal everything to him. There were normal things that he did not know. But the Jesus in Revelation is eternally omniscient. He knows all things. There's no more he will have to ever learn again. He knows everything, and he knows everything about you, and he knows what you're going through, and he knows what's going on in the world today. Finally, the Jesus of the Gospels was the suffering Son of Man and Savior, but the Jesus of Revelation is the present and forever reigning King. Let's, in the time we have remaining, Let's take a look at a few verses in the book of Revelation to have a fresh look at the Jesus of the book of Revelation. Now, remember the book of Revelation is a book of, of symbolism, visual symbolisms. And, and I'm not going to try to get into the details of explaining the implications and depth of each of the visual things that John saw, but instead, here's what I'm going to ask you to do today. Don't, don't, don't get too caught up in, in the specific meaning of the symbols, but instead, just experience him. Just, just experience. You don't have to understand it all. You don't have to be able to explain it all. Just seek to experience the Jesus in Revelation. Let's look at Revelation 1, verses uh, 5 and 6. It says, And from Jesus Christ, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him be, remember that word, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. No longer <clears throat> are the religious and political leaders persecuting him, but rather he is now ruling over the earth with glory and dominion forever and ever. A glory he did not have completely in the Gospels, but a glory he has now in heaven, and he's ruling in response to that glory. Let's go down to Revelation 4, verses 10 and 11. The 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive what? To receive glory and honor and power. Remember in the Gospels, it says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I want you to know that's no longer true. The Son of Man has a place, and it is at the right hand of God. It is at the throne, the right hand of God, the place of blessing and honor and authority. That's where he is today. And all of heaven was ascribing glory to the ascended glorified Jesus. We continue to see it in chapter 5, verse 11. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and Glory and blessing. It goes on to say, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor. Here it is again. And glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. 
When we go to the end of the book, Revelation 21, 23 says it this way. The city, the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it. For here it is, the glory of God himself illuminated it. The lamb is its light. In the eternal state that we all have to look forward to, there isn't going to be any artificial light. There isn't even going to be any created light because the glory of God the Father and the glory of the resurrected, ascended, glorified Jesus are going to be the light that illuminates that eternal state. Now, I want to do one last thing. We're going to go to Revelation 1. And I want to look at the vision, the vision that John had of Jesus in chapter 1. Now, I want you to think about something. Who is, who, who is John? Remember, he was one of the 12. But not only was he one of the 12, remember, he was the closest. Of all 12, he was the closest to Jesus. So think about it. He knew the Jesus of the Gospels. For three and a half years, he knew him better than any other human being knew him. For three and a half years, he knew the Jesus of the Gospels. Now, he's having a revelation of a Jesus of the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And again, as we go through this, don't worry about all the symbolism. Just take in his glory. Just behold his Glory. So, what is the book of Revelation about? It is a revealing of Jesus, not as he was, but as he is and forever will be. Verses 5 and 6. From Jesus Christ, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And then, verse 8. I am, this is uh, what John hears. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Notice this is how Jesus introduces himself to us in the book of Revelation. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, I want, I want you to catch something here. Uh, we're, we're contrasting the Jesus of the Gospels with the Jesus of Revelation. And here's what I, I want you to catch. The Jesus before the Gospels. The Jesus before the Gospels is the same as the Jesus in Revelation. In other words, the, in the beginning, God, and that, that was the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, glorified. That, that's the Jesus from the very beginning. But you know what he did? For 33 and a half years, he set aside that glory. He said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it'll be here when I get back. I'm just going to set it aside. I'm going to go to the earth as a human. I won't cease to be God, and that's a mystery we can't fully grasp. How could he be fully God and fully man? But he was. He came to earth 33 and a half years, and then what did he do when he ascended? back into heaven, he picked up where he left off before his uh, incarnation to the earth. He took on once again that glory that he had with the Father from the very beginning. And then notice it says that he, I'm the beginning and the end, catch this, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The Jesus who is is the same Jesus John was seeing. The Jesus who was is the Jesus of the Gospels. And the Jesus who is to come is the Jesus who is when he comes back to get us. And then, verse 10 and 11, I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Clearly, from what we just read, he's hearing the voice of Jesus. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. Catch that, one like. In other words, I kind of recognize him, but it's something different. Uh, he's he's kind of like the Jesus of the Gospels, but he's kind of not like the Jesus of the Gospel. One like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. In other words, Jesus was clothed in his high priestly garments to carry out his high priestly eternal function. Hebrews 
talks about it this way. Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Catch this. Let us therefore, because he's in heaven, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's a good verse for today. That's a good verse for today. You and I are invited to come, not timidly, but to come boldly before that throne of grace. Why are we to go there? It says to find grace and mercy in time of need. Many people today are in time of need, but I've got good news for you. Everything you need is, is in that place. Everything you need is at the right hand of the Father. And you and I are invited boldly to come, and it's by His grace and by his mercy that he's going to meet your need and protect you and to provide for you in this day and hour. Let's go back to the vision. Verse 14 of Revelation 1, his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass as refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. Now let's go back. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. As I Read that, I picture the glory of the Father just emanating from his countenance. And I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know, but I'm guessing when John saw that, he's like, wait a minute. I got a commercial a while back with a preview of this. <laughs> it's Matthew 17, 1 and 2, before the resurrection. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Catch this. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. I, I'm, I'm sure, like, now John was like, oh, that's what that was about. And by the way, did you know after this one, Jesus said, by the way, don't tell anybody. <laughs> Do not tell anybody till after I'm gone. All right, well, let's go back to Revelation uh, 1, 14 and 15 again. There it is, his head and his hair were white uh, like uh, wool, as white as snow. Now catch this, his eyes, his eyes like a flame of fire. I, I can't even hardly imagine looking in to those eyes as they penetrate and yet at the same time purify. Yeah, they, they penetrate. We're, we're probably like, like John at the time. We feel undone, but then there's, there's the purifying of those eyes as they flow from his holiness and his righteousness. And then it says his feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace representing that he is the one who's going to administer holy justice. Finally, the injustices of the earth are going to be properly dealt with. And then it says his voice was the sound of many waters, powerful, majestic. Psalm 29 describes it, and I won't go there. But let's go to verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in strength. Out of his mouth, it says, came a two-edged sword. And we know from Hebrews uh, chapter 4 and verse 12 and Ephesians six seventeen that sword is the word of God. And it's out of the word of God that he's going to administer God's justice in grace and in truth. Notice uh, verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Remember, this is the John who knew Jesus better than everybody. But as he saw this vision, he was so overtaken, he fell. We don't see him doing that in the Gospels. He fell, and he's, he's, he's afraid. But notice what Jesus says. Jesus says, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And again, that's a message for us in this day and hour. Do not be afraid. And it's as though he was saying to John, hey, I know you're a little trembling right now in all that you're seeing, but you're welcome here. You're welcome to see all you're seeing. And, and I believe God is saying the same thing to you and I today. 
behold him as he is. It may at times be overwhelming, but do not be afraid. It goes on to say, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of, of Hades and death. Notice he said that I uh, was dead and am alive forevermore. Do you know that's not true of any other God? Think about it. No other God of the entire universe has ever died and rose from the dead to live forever and ever. Only Jesus has that title. And then uh, verse 19, he... Um, Verse 19, he tells John to write all this stuff down, which is why we have the book of Revelation. And then uh, close with verse 20. The mystery, he now explains the mystery, the vision. The, min the mi mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. That word angels can be translated messengers. Messengers, probably describing the leadership of those churches. John wrote in the next two chapters seven letters, one to each of those churches, which represent all churches. And, and so John is writing to the people who are in leadership positions. And a part of the meaning of this vision is that Jesus has these messengers in his hand. They're in his hand to get direction from him. They're in his hand to be empowered by him. They're in his hand, if need be, to be corrected by him. But then notice it says that the uh, seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. Where is Jesus today? He's in the midst of his people. Where is he today? Uh, he is in the midst of his people. In other words, he hasn't left his church. In the midst of his church, he knows exactly what his church needs. And in this day and hour, he is there to provide all that his church needs. He is there to direct, to correct, to empower, to encourage. And I want to let you know today, remind you today, that because you are a part of the people of God, he's in your midst. He's in your midst. He's not just here in a building. He's in your home. He's in your heart. And he is in your midst, knowing exactly what you're going through and what you need. And he is there to sustain you, to protect you, to provide for you. So as we close this morning, on this Easter morning, let's pursue a revelation of the ascended, glorified Jesus. Well, we're not going to forget about the Jesus of the Gospels, but we're not going to stop there. We're going to go to the Jesus of revelation. And we're going to have a revelation of Jesus glorified, ruling and reigning as he is today. And may that revelation encourage you and strengthen you. I want to pray for you today. Would you join me? Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you that Jesus rose from the dead and we are here celebrating that resurrection we thank you, God, that even though church buildings are empty, your people are not empty, but your people have the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead dwelling in them. And we thank you that in this day and in this hour, you are ruling and reigning. We know that we don't understand all the different uh, aspects of that, but your word tells us that you are ruling and reigning, and we believe it. We believe you are going to write the final chapter, and we thank you that you are in the midst of your royal light bearers, the candlesticks, for you have called your people to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and you are there to illuminate through us to the world. And so, Lord, today, let our lights shine brightly in this day and hour. And, Lord, may we be encouraged to know that you are right there in the midst. And just as in the letters in chapters 2 and 3, you called every church to overcome, you are calling your people in this day and in this hour to overcome. And we accept that exhortation, and we declare we are going to overcome. And Lord, I thank you that by your power, we will overcome. 
Well, God bless you on this Easter Sunday. I know it's going to be different not sitting down uh, with, a, with a meal with all of your family, but uh, be thankful to God for your health, for your family members. Use uh, social media and technology to connect uh, with them today, and I look forward to worshiping with you again uh, next Sunday, uh, 10 o'clock, and by the way, Pastor Becky's going to be bringing a powerful message to encourage you next Sunday. So happy Easter to all of you from your Jubilee family, and have a wonderful Resurrection Day.